gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Kustoff, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Director Cordray, for being here this morning and this afternoon. I'm a, uh, as the Chairman would say, a recovering lawyer and a former United States Attorney, and I'd like to talk to you, if I can, uh, some of these questions, lawyer to lawyer, if, if, if you will. Okay. Talk to you about district court, if I can, for a moment. In the United States District Court, uh, you would agree that in order for the court to consider a claim or a lawsuit, that a party must submit a pleading that contains a short and plain statement, which shows that the complainant is entitled to relief. You would agree to that, wouldn't you? That's a requirement, and it's policed by the courts, yes. Thank you. And in order to meet the pleading standard, what's required under the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, this relief must be plausible. It must be, it must be credible. You would agree with that as well, that that's an accurate statement? I believe that's, it, I have no reason to contest your statement of law. I'm a little rusty on some of these procedural issues, but again, courts will decide whether we did that or didn't do that, and we abide by it. Sounds right, though, doesn't it? Sounds, well, okay. sounds like a sensible rule. I hope it is the rule, yes. And you would also agree that the Supreme Court, our Supreme Court, has made a point to distinguish what's called likely harm from conceivable harm, the latter of which would not allow be allowed to proceed. Is that correct? Likely harm from conceivable harm. Starting to wish I would have had you as a law school <laughs> professor, but uh, that sounds sensible to me, yes. Fair enough. In other words, the, the threshold to get into federal court is a fairly low standard. You, you would agree with that as well? To bring a case, yes. Okay. Of course, it has to survive motion to dismiss or motion for summary judgment and everything else, but, but uh, uh, that's that's my understanding of how the rules have been developed. Yeah. And I and I would agree with what you what you just said. I do want to talk to you about the matter that the CFPB brought in the Eastern District of North Dakota, which I think Mr. Tipton touched on briefly. The yes, the UDAP order against uh, Intercept Corporation. Yes, as I'm, I, I'm, as I'm I generally familiar with the case. Okay. Yes, as I understand it, Intercept Corporation is a third-party payments processor company. Yes. And the, the allegation was against the uh, against violations by its consumers. Is that correct? Mm, it, 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 well, it was against the payment processor as, I think, aiding and abetting facilitating violations against consumers with enough knowledge to be held responsible and, and to kind of maybe get to where you're going. The court found that we did not plead enough facts to make out a case and granted a motion to dismiss in that case. So it goes to show we do not, as, as was said, we do not win every case. Uh, and we're, we're right now still digesting that opinion and trying to figure out what it means for the investigation we were conducting there. Well, I do, in my remaining time, I want to ask you about that. Because, yes. Because Judge, Judge Ralph Erickson made uh, some, fairly, some fairly sharp remarks. Mm -hmm. He said, although the complaint, and I'm quoting, does not contain detailed factual allegations, it must contain, need not contain detailed factual allegations, it must contain more than an unadorned, the defendant unlawfully harmed me accusation. That's mm -hmm. a quote unquote. You would agree that that was, that was what he said in the opinion. Correct? Yeah, I mean, I think our complaint said much more than that, but if that's what, that's the way the judge viewed it, then, then the judge certainly, uh, uh, decides accordingly, and we have to then uh, un absorb that, understand it, and figure out how to how to uh, uh, how to deal with it. In fact, he said that the facts in the complaint must be plausible, not merely conceivable. Yes, and he found that they were not plausible and merely conceivable. I guess. Uh, and he further he further cited or stated in his opinion his opinion mm -hmm. quote that the that the complaint quote never pleads facts sufficient to support the legal conclusion that consumers were injured or likely to be injured, close quote, and that, quote, it does not contain sufficient factual allegations to back up conclusory statements regarding Intercept's allegedly unlawful acts or admissions. So, so to this point in that case, uh, we got it wrong to that degree. We've had many, many other cases that we filed where motions to dismiss were filed against us uh, and we prevailed on the motion. So, you know, uh, when you were U.S. Attorney in Tennessee, I assume you didn't win every case, even though you tried. 
Well, uh, the, the, the difference is, is I wouldn't have brought a case unless I thought that I, number one, that somebody broke the law, and two, that I could, that I could absolutely prove. I understand, but I, was, we, didn't, we didn't bring a case where we thought nobody broke the law. We thought they did. The judge disagreed with us, and okay then, fair enough. In fact, enough. this court found that there was no nexus to the consumer, no yeah, that's, that's harm to the agreed. consumer. Agreed, that's, that's what the court found. And, and I'm sure you brought cases where you thought you were gonna get a guilty verdict and you didn't, or maybe they were even NOLA prosecuted or whatever. I mean, I'm sure that ha it happens. It's, it's not, a, not a big mark, mark of honor for us that we had a case dismissed on a motion to dismiss, but usually the vast majority of the cases that survived that threshold, and this time, this judge felt we misjudged it. Gentlemen's Fair enough. Time has expired. Learn from that Thank and you figure that, out how I to handle it.